So you may have noticed Reverend Chad and Reverend Michael are nowhere to be found today. They are both off on wonderful adventures. And they send their love and their greetings to you. Reverend Chad will be ne back next week. Reverend Michael will be back on the 12th. And we are so fortunate to have the Lamberts, Catherine and Jason, leading today. It has been a wonderful experience always to work with them with worship leading. And especially on a day when um, they needed to be, I don't know, who's Chad, who's Michael? You're not sure. Okay. <laughs> But we do thank you so much. During the season of Eastertide this year, we are on a journey. Over this past month, we have spent time together looking at the sacred art of recovery as a way of journeying toward wholeness. This series is based on the 12 steps that originated with Alcoholics Anonymous and that has been expanded to help individuals, all of us in fact, with all kinds of addictions. Many of us have thankfully found the rooms of these programs, or we are fortunate to know people who are working on the 12 steps as a way of life. These rooms, these programs are a way of recovering the person we have lost, which is of course ourselves. If we are open to the life stories of people in recovery, we are often to surprised to learn that people who work on these steps possess a wisdom we all desperately need. Part of the wisdom is that although these steps do work together as a way of transformation, they are individual steps and each step is extremely important. Working a program of recovery is not a quick fix. It is not fast. It is instead a lifelong process that brings life to places that were dead. When I was in junior high, that's the ancient history term for middle school, I went to the Aztec pyramids in Mexico. I have, since I was a small child, been fascinated with history. Fortunately, my parents provided opportunities for me to delve into historical settings whenever we traveled as a family. Learning about the Aztec culture and seeing the pyramids was an incredible experience. And I, of course, insisted that we climb to the top of one of them. My mother and my sister passed, but my dad and I took it on. I have absolutely no idea how many steps there were, but it was a large number. And even though my mom had warned me to be careful, I wanted to try taking two or three at a time because I have always been in a hurry. My dad was patient with it at first. And then finally, as I got further and further away from him, he said, Laura, stop, listen. If we want to make it to the top, we need to take it one step at a time. Even if you are the adventurous type, the 12 steps are best taken one step at a time. And in fact, it may be necessary to climb down one or two and start back up again. It takes many people who are serious about recovery years to go through the steps. And those who are really wise continue to work them forever. The gospels and the stories of Jesus are often centered around people who are somewhere in this journey that the 12 steps illustrate so astutely. The woman in our story today is no exception. If you were here, by the way, in person or listened online a couple of weeks ago, this morning you might have wondered why Jason and Catherine were reading the exact same gospel story that we read on Sunday, April 14th. If you heard that story two weeks ago, if you recognized it today, and if you wondered what the heck we were doing, you get extra points for paying attention. It was the same story. You are right. The elements are exactly the same. There are only two characters, Jesus and the woman he met at the well, although one could argue that the well was also a character because it does play an important role in this text. 
In the first portion from the story two weeks ago, we learned very little about this woman. But I think it is fair to say when she met Jesus at the well that day, she did not anticipate she would have a chance to experience a freedom she never dreamed possible. It was an ordinary day, just like every single other day of her life. But on that day, a stranger offered her a gift of freedom, a gift from all that it held her captive. When the gift was offered, the woman could have said, no thanks, or I do not believe you, or I am doing just fine, thank you, or I don't need your help. Instead, in the second scene of the story we heard today, this woman opened herself up and asked for the gift that was being offered. It was a gift of water, and not just any water. It was a gift of living water, a gift that was capable of refreshing her soul. In many ways, Jesus offered this woman a quick startup version of the 12 steps. In the short time they spent together, Jesus helped her understand her powerlessness and gave her the hope of restoration. Yet Jesus could not make this woman take the gift she had to decide she wanted to be free. And when she made that decision, Jesus helped her through some tough love walk through a moral inventory of her life. Her response showed she was more than ready to give up what had brought her to this point. And when she asked for the water, she asked for the freedom from all that was binding her. Some of us want to change our lives so desperately. But when the opportunity for freedom shows up, we can think of a hundred reasons not to take the chance. It might be the cycle of shame we are caught in, which makes us believe we don't deserve to be set free. Or perhaps fear has ruled our life for so long, we are afraid of what we might find if we dig too deep in our lives. Or maybe we are worried that people will learn too much about us. Or we may have deep-seated anger that has caused us to mistrust almost everyone. Or perhaps we still harbor the hope that all the defects of our character can be controlled. As Rami Shapiro reminds us, we are usually ready for God to remove the rough edges of our character, but not to remove them entirely. At this stage, we often truly believe that with God's help, we can learn to control our so-called defects of character, and by doing so, show them to be what we know them to be, not defects at all, but endearing quirks that make us unique. At least that's a good story. As one minister and a member of a 12-step group said, even after all my effort to get to this place, to get to the sixth step, I was still excusing my behavior and clinging to the illusion of control. Shapiro gently explains that the reason we cling to our defects of character is that our lives are so invested in our particular addictions and the insanity they created, we cannot imagine what life will be like without them. And because we cannot know who we will be, we are afraid to let go of who we have been. Shapiro quotes from the 12 and 12, the 12 steps and the 12 traditions of AA, which say, 
practically everybody wishes to be read of their most glaring and destructive faults. But what we must recognize now is that we exalt in some of our defects and we really love them. Who, for example, doesn't like to feel a little superior to the next person or a lot superior? And isn't it true that we like to let greed masquerade as an ambition? And self-righteous anger? Self-righteous anger can be quite enjoyable. My defects of character have always been so wrapped up in who I am that to let go was more than frightening. It was terrifying. When the bottom fell out of our world, when the unimaginable happened with one of our children, I truly believed it was in my power to fix everything. But the bottom just kept moving lower and lower. And finally, I had no choice but to give up a persona, which was in essence the very core of who I knew myself to be in order to continue to be able to live. I finally found myself entirely ready to have God remove all those defects of my character. Shapiro goes on to say, the self we imagine ourselves to be is a character in a drama we tell about our lives. We build our identities out of half-remembered events from our past. Then we add the feelings those memories generate and the ideas we have about those feelings. He says, we're like playwrights. Playwrights who so identify with the lead character in their play that they began to mistake the play for real life and the character for themselves. In the context of 12-step recovery, however, being brought low is redemptive. The Holy One can't lift us up until we at last humble ourselves. When I was getting a little all in myself, my mother used to talk about eating humble pie. And as bad as it tastes, humility helps us remember we have not arrived. There is more work to be done. In order to humbly ask God to remove our shortcomings, Shapiro says, we have to be humbled. And to be humbled, we have to look at the shame and the guilt and destructive behaviors that got us to this point. It is from this low place that we ask in the low way. Our asking is only humble because we have been humbled. So we humbly ask God to remove our shortcomings and thank goodness there is a fierce grace that exists when we get to these low places, a grace that is always and forever with us no matter how low we go or no matter how much we have put up barriers so that we can't hear anymore. This week, the need for these steps became very real to me again. And once more, I'm seeing up close and personal that which I cannot control. No matter how much I want to fix the person I love so dearly. So my husband and I realized we need to find an Al-Anon meeting. And I'm grateful that I knew the person here who could help us find those rooms as we go back and begin working the steps once again. That is the beauty of the rooms and the beauty of this church. So with gratitude for this series and for all of you, I say, hi, my name is Laura. May it ever be so. 
May it ever be so for all of us. Amen.